what is a, at a high level the game of diplomacy? Yeah, so I talked a lot about two-player zero-sum games. And what's interesting about diplomacy is that it's very different from these like adversarial uh, games like chess, Go, poker, even StarCraft and Dota. Diplomacy has a much bigger cooperative element to it. It's a seven-player game. It was actually created in the 50s, um, and it takes place uh, before World War I. It's like a map of Europe with seven great powers, um, and they're all trying to form alliances with each other. There's a lot of negotiation going on. Um, and so the whole focus of the game is on forming alliances with the other players to take on the other players. England, Germany, Russia, Turkey, Austria, Hungary, Italy, and France. That's right, yeah. So the way the game works is on each turn, you spend about you know five to 15 minutes talking to the other players in private. And you make all sorts of deals with them. You say like, hey, let's work together. Um, you know, Let's team up against this other player. Because the only way that you can make progress is by working with somebody else against the others. Um, and then after that negotiation period is done, all the players simultaneously submit their moves and they're all executed at the same time. And so you can tell people like, hey, I'm going to support you this turn, um, but then you don't follow through with it. And they're only going to figure that out once they see the moves being read off. How much of it is natural language, like written, actual text? How much is like uh, you're actually saying phrases that are structured? So there's different ways to play the game. You know, you can play it in person. And in that case, it's all natural language, um, free form communication. There's no constraints on the kinds of deals that you can make, the kinds of things that you can discuss. Um, you can also play it online. So you can, you know, send long emails back and forth. Um, you can play it like live online or over voice chat. Um, but the, the focus, the, the important thing to understand is that this is unstructured communication. You can say whatever you want. Um, you can make any sorts of deals that you want and everything is done privately. So it's not like you're all around the board together having a conversation. You're grabbing somebody going off into a corner and conspiring behind everybody else's back about what you're planning. And, uh, there's no limit in theory, to the conversation you can have directly with one person. That's right. You can make all sorts of, um, you can talk about anything. You could say like, hey, let's have a long-term alliance against this guy. You can say like, hey, can you support me this turn? And re in return, I'll do this other thing for you next turn. Or, um, you know, yeah, just you can talk about like what you talked about with somebody else and gossip about like what they're planning. Um, the way that I would describe the game is that it's kind of like a mix between Risk, Poker, and the TV show Survivor. There's like this big element of like trying to, um, yeah, there's a, there's a big social element. And, and the best way that I would describe the game is that it's really a game about people rather than the pieces. So Risk, because it is a map, it's kind of war game like. Uh, poker, because there's a game theory component that's very kind of strategic. So you could convert it into an artificial intelligence problem. And then survive it because of the social component. That's right. Strong social component. I saw that somebody said online that the internet version of the, of the game has this quality of that it's easier to almost to do like role playing as opposed to being yourself. You can actually like be the, like really imagine yourself as the leader of France or Russia and so on. Like really pretend to be that person. It's actually fun to really lean into being that, that leader. Yeah, so some some players do go this route where they just like kind of view it as a strategy game, but also a role playing game where they can like act out like, what would I be like if I was you know a leader of France in 1900? Uh, forfeit right away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they sometimes use like the old timey language to like um, or how they imagine the elites would talk at that time. Anyway, so the what are the different turns of the game? Like what are the rounds? Yeah, so on on every turn you got like. A bunch of different units that you start out with. So you start out um, controlling like just a few units, and the object of the game is to gain control of a majority of the map. If you're able, to, if you're able to do that, then you've won the game. But like I said, the only way that you're able to do that is by working with other players. So on every turn, you can issue a move order. So for each of your units, you can move them to an adjacent territory, or you can keep them where they are, or you can support a move or a hold of a different unit. So. What are the territories? Well, how how is the map divided up? It's kind of like Risk, where the the map is divided up into like fifty different territories. Yeah. Um, now 
you can enter a territory if you're moving into that territory with more supports than the person that's in there or the person that's trying to move in there. So if you're moving in and there's somebody already there, um, then if neither of you have support, it's a one versus one and you'll bounce back and neither of you will make progress. If you have a unit that's supporting that move into the territory, then it's a two versus one and you'll kick them out and they'll have to retreat somewhere. What does support mean? Support is like, it's a, it's an action that you can issue in the game. So you can say this unit, you, you write down, this unit is supporting this other unit into this territory. Are, th are these units from opposing forces? They from could be, they could be. And this is, this is where the interesting aspect of the game comes in because you can support your own units into territory, but you can also support other people's units into territories. And so that's what the negotiations really revolve around. But you don't have to do the thing you say you're going to do. And right. this, yeah, and so, so this you is, can say I'm going to support you, but then backstab the person. Yeah, okay. that's absolutely right. And that tension is is core to the game. That tension is absolutely core to the game. the The fact that you can make all sorts of promises, but you have to reason about the fact that, like, hey, they might not trust you if you say you're going to do something, or they might be lying to you uh, when they say that they're going to support you. So uh, maybe just just to jump back, what's what's the history of the game in general? Is it true that Henry Kissinger loved the game and JFK and all those? I've read like a bunch of different people that, or is that just one of those things that the cool kids say they, they do, but they don't actually play? So the game was created in the 50s. Yeah. Um, and from what I understand, it, it was um, JFK's, it was played in like the JFK White House, Henry Kissinger's favorite game. I don't know if it's true, but um, that's definitely what I've heard. It's interesting that they went with World War One when it was created after World War Two. So... The story that I've heard for the creation of the game is it was created by um, somebody that had looked at the history of uh, the 20th century and they saw World War I as a failure of diplomacy. So, sure. yeah. you know, they saw the fact that this war broke out uh, as like the, the diplomats of all these countries like really failed to prevent a war. And he wanted to create a game that would basically teach people about diplomacy. Um, and... It's really fascinating that like in his ideal version of the game of diplomacy, nobody actually wins the game because the whole point is that if somebody is about to win, then the other players should be able to work together to stop that person from winning. And so the ideal version of the game is just one where, where nobody actually wins. And, you know, it kind of has a nice, like wholesome take home message then that, you know, war, war is ultimately futile. And, uh, and, and uh, that optimal, that futile optimal could be achieved through great diplomacy. So uh, is there some asymmetry in, in terms of which is more powerful, Russia versus Germany versus uh, France and so on? So I think the general consensus is that France is the strongest power in the game. But okay. the beautiful thing about diplomacy is that it's it's self-balancing, right? So it's the fact that France has an inherent advantage from the beginning means that the other players are less likely to work with it. I saw that Russia has four units for, or four of something that the others have three of something. That's true, yeah. So Russia starts off with four units while they, all the other players start with three. But Russia is also in a much more vulnerable position because they have to like, um, they have a lot more neighbors as well. Got it. Yeah. Larger territory, more, uh, yeah, right. More border mm -hmm. to defend. Okay. Uh, what else is what else is important to know about the rules? So there, there's, how many rounds are there? Like, is this iterative game? Is there is it is a finite? Do you just keep going indefinitely? Usually, the game lasts. Uh, I would say about fifteen or twenty turns. Um, there's in theory no limit. It could last longer, but at some point, I mean, if you're playing a house game with friends, at some point you just get tired and you all agree, like, okay, we're going to end the game here and call it a draw. Um, if you're playing online, there's usually like set limits on when the game will actually end. And what's the end? What's the termination condition? Like, there's the the there's one country have to conquer everything else so if somebody is able to actually gain control of a majority of the map then then they've won the game and that is a, a solo victory as it's called now that pretty rarely happens especially with strong players because like i said the game is designed to uh, incentivize the other players to put a stop to that and all work together to, to stop the superpower um usually what ends up happening is that you know all the players agree to a draw and then the the score the the win is divided among the the remaining players um, there's a lot of different scoring systems. The one that we used in our research um, basically um, gives a score relative to how much control you have of the map. So the more that you control, the higher your score. What's the history of using this game as a benchmark for AI research? Do, pe do people use it? Yeah. So 
people have been working on AI for diplomacy since about the 80s. Um, there was some really exciting research back then, but the approach that was taken was very different from what we see today. I mean, the research in the 80s was a very uh, rule-based approach, kind of it, kind of a heuristic approach. It was very in line with the kind of research that was being done in the 80s. You know, basically trying to encode human knowledge into the strategy of the AI. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's understandable. I mean, the game is so incredibly different and so so much more complicated than the kinds of games that people were working on, like chess and Go uh, and poker, that it, it was honestly even hard to like start getting making any progress in, in in diplomacy can you just formulate what is the problem from an ai perspective and why is it hard why is it a challenging game to solve so there's a lot of aspects in diplomacy that make it a huge challenge um first of all you have the natural language components and i think this really is what makes it arguably the most difficult um uh game among like the major benchmarks the fact that you have to, it's not about moving pieces on the board. Your action space is basically all the different sentences that you could communicate to somebody else in this game. Yeah. And um, is there, can we just like linger on that? So is part of it like the ambiguity in the language? If if it was like very strict, if you narrowed the set of possible sentences you could do, would that simplify the game significantly? The The real difficulty is the breadth of things that you can talk about mm -hmm. um you can have natural language in other games and uh, like settlers of Catan, for example like you could have a natural language settlers of Catan ai but the things that you're going to talk about are basically like am i trading you two sheep for a wood or three sheep for a wood um whereas in a game like diplomacy the breadth of conversations that you're going to have are like you know, am I going to support you? Are you going to support me in return? Which units are, are going to do what? Uh, what did this other person say, promise you? Uh, they're lying because they told this other person that they're going to do this instead. Um, if you help me out this turn, then in the future, I'll do these things that will help you out. Um, the the depth and breadth of these conversations is, is really complicated. And it's all being done in natural language. Um, now you could approach it, and we actually consider doing this, like you, you know, having a, a simplified language to make this complexity uh, smaller. But ultimately, we thought the most impactful way of doing this research would be to uh, address the natural language component head on, and, and just try to go for the full game up front. Just looking at sample games and what the conversations look like. Greetings, England. This should prove to be a fun game since all the private press is going to be made public at the end. At the least, it will be interesting to see if the press changes because of that. Anyway, good. Okay. So there, there's like... Uh, yeah, that's just kind of like the generic greetings at the beginning of the game. Okay. I think that the meat comes a little bit later when you're starting to talk about like specific strategy and stuff. I agree. There are a lot of advantages to the two of us keeping in touch and our nations make strong natural allies in the middle game. So that kind of stuff. Uh, making friends, making enemies. Yeah, or like if you look at the next line, so the person saying like, I've heard uh, bits about a Lepanto and an octopus opening and basically telling Austria like, hey, just a heads up, you know, I've heard these whispers about like what might be going on behind your back. Yeah, so, but so there's all kinds of complexities in that, in the in the language of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like to interpret what, that, what the heck that means. It's hard for us humans, but for AI, it's even harder. You have to understand, like at every level, the the semantics of that. Right. I mean, there's the there's the complexity in understanding when somebody is saying this to me. What does that mean? And then there's also the complexity of like, should I be telling this person this? Like, I've overheard these these whispers. Should I be telling this person that, like, hey, you might be getting attacked by by this other power? Okay. So, what? How are we supposed to think about? Okay. So that's the natural language. How how do you even begin trying to solve this game? It seems like. It seems like the Turing test on steroids. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's the natural language aspect, and then even besides the natural language aspect, you also have the the cooperative elements of the game. And I think this is actually um, something that I find really interesting. If you look at all of the previous game AI uh, breakthroughs, they've all happened in these purely adversarial games where you don't actually need to understand how humans play the game. It's all just AI versus AI, right? Like you look at uh, checkers, chess, Go, poker. Starcraft, Dota 2, like in some of those cases, they leveraged human data, but they never needed to. They were always just trying to have a scalable algorithm that 
then they could throw a lot of computational resources at, a lot of memory at, and then eventually it would converge to an approximation of a Nash equilibrium. This perfect strategy that in a two-player zero-sum game guarantees that they're going to be able to not lose to any opponent. So you can't leverage self-play to solve this game. You you can leverage self-play, but it's no longer sufficient to beat humans. So how do you integrate the human into the loop of this? So what you have to do is incorporate human data. Um, and to kind of give you some intuition for why this is the case, like imagine you're playing a negotiation game like, like diplomacy, um, but you're training completely from scratch without any human data. The, the AI is not going to suddenly like figure out how to communicate in English. It's going to figure out some weird robot language that only it will understand. Yeah. And then when you stick that in a game with six other humans, they're going to think this person's talking gibberish and they're just going to ally with each other and team up against the bot. Or not even team up against the bot, but just not work with the bot. And so in order to be able to play this game with humans, it has to understand the human way of playing the game, not this machine way of playing the game. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, right. That, that's, a, that's a nuanced thing to understand because a chess playing program doesn't need to play like a human to beat a human. Exactly. But here you have to play like a human in order to beat them. Or at least you have to understand how humans play the game so that you can understand how to work with them. If they have certain expectations about what does it mean to be a good ally, what does it mean to have like a, a reciprocal relationship where we're working together, you have to abide by those conventions. And if you don't, they're just going to work with somebody else instead. Do you think of this as a, a clean, in some deep sense, of the spirit of the Turing test as formulated by Alan Turing? Is, is it... In some sense, this is what the Turing test actually looks like. So uh, because of open-ended natural language conversation seems like very difficult to evaluate. Like here at a high stakes where humans are trying to win a game, that seems like how you actually perform the Turing test. I think it's different from the Turing test. Like the way that the Turing test is formulated, it's about trying to distinguish a human from a machine and seeing, oh, could the machine... Uh, successfully pass as a human in this adversarial setting where the a where the player is trying to figure out whether it's a machine or a human. Whereas in diplomacy, it's not about trying to figure out whether this player is a human or a machine. It's ultimately about whether I can work with this player, regardless of whether they are a human or a machine. And can the machine do that better than a human can? Yeah, I'm going to to think about that, but that just feels like the implied requirement for that is for the machine to be human-like. I think that's I think that's true, that if you're going to play in this human game, you have to somehow adapt to the to the human surroundings and the human play style. And to win, you have to adapt. So you can't, if you're the outsider, if you're not human-like, I feel like that's a losing strategy. I think that's, I think that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Um, uh, what what are the complexities here? What was your approach to it? Before I get to that, one thing I should explain, like why we decided to work on diplomacy. Yeah. So basically what happened is in 2019, um, I was wrapping up the work on six player poker on Pluribus and was trying to think about what to work on next. And I had been seeing like all these other breakthroughs happening in AI. I mean, like 2019, you have StarCraft, you have Alpha Star beating humans in StarCraft. You've got the Dota 2 stuff happening at OpenAI. You have GPT-2 or GPT-3, come, I think it was GPT-2 at the time. Mm -hmm. And it became clear that AI was progressing really, really rapidly. And people were throwing out these like other games about you know what should be the next challenge for, for multi-agent AI. And I just felt like we had to aim bigger. Um, if you look at a game like chess or a game like Go, they took decades for researchers to to ultimately reach superhuman performance at. I mean, like chess took 40 years of AI research. Go took another 20 years. Um, and we we thought that diplomacy would be this incredibly difficult challenge that could easily take a decade to, to make an AI that could play competently. Um, but we felt like that was, that was a goal worth aiming for. Um, and so honestly, I was kind of reluctant to work on it at first because I, I thought it was like too far out of the realm of possibility. But, you know, I was talking to a coworker of mine, Adam Learer, and he was basically saying like, eh, why not aim for it? You know, it, we'll learn some interesting things along the way and maybe it'll be possible. Um, and so, so we decided to go for it. And 
I, I think I think it was the right choice considering just how much progress there there was in AI and that that progress has continued in the years since. So winning in diplomacy, what does that really look like? It means talking to six other players, six other entities, agents, and convincing and convincing them of stuff that you want them to be convinced of. Like what what exactly I'm trying to get like to deeply understand what the problem is. Ultimately, the problem is is simple to to quantify, right? Like you're going to play this game with humans and you want your score on average to be um, as high as possible. You know, if you can say like, I am winning more than any any human alive, um, then you're a champion diplomacy player. Um, now, ultimately we, have, we didn't reach that. We got to human level performance. We actually, so we played about 40 games with, with real humans online. Uh, the bot came in second out of all players that played five or more games. And um, so not like number one, but way, way higher than- well, What was the expertise level? Are they beginners? Are they intermediate players, advanced players? Do so you have that, a sense? That's a great question. And so I think this kind of goes into how do you measure the performance in diplomacy? And I would argue that when you're measuring performance in a game like this, you don't actually want to measure it in games with all expert players. Uh, it's kind of like if you're developing a self-driving car, you don't want to measure that car on the road with a bunch of expert stunt drivers. Yeah. You want to put it on a road of like an actual American city and see, is this car crashing less often than an expert driver would? Yeah. So so that's the metric that we've used. We, we're we saying like, we're going to stick this game, we're going to stick this bot in games with a wide variety of skill levels. And then are we doing better than a strong or expert human player would in the same situation? That, that's quite brilliant because I, I played a lot of sports in my life, like, as a tennis, judo, whatever. And it's somehow almost easier to go against experts almost always. I don't, I don't, I, I think they're more predictable in the quality of play. <laughs> the, yeah. the space of strategies you're operating under is narrower against experts. It's more fun. It's really frustrating to go against beginners. Also, because beginners talk trash to you when they somehow do beat you. So it's, that's a human thing that they had doesn't have to be worried about that. But yeah, the variance in strategies right. is, is greater, especially with natural language. It's just all over the place then. True. Yeah, and, and honestly, when you look at what makes a good human diplomacy player, um, obviously they're able to handle themselves in games with other expert humans, but th where they really shine is when they're playing with these weak players and they know how to take advantage uh, of the fact that they're a weak player, that they won't be able to like pull off a stab as well, or that um, they have certain tendencies and they can take them under their wing and persuade them to do things that might not even be in their interest. Um, the really good diplomacy players are, are able to to take advantage of the fact that there that there are some weak players in the game. Okay, so if you have to incorporate human play data, how how do you do that? How do you do that in order to train an AI system to play diplomacy? Yeah, so that's that's really the, the crux of the problem. How do we um, leverage the benefits of self play that have been so successful in all these other previous games while keeping the strategy as uh, as human compatible as possible? And so what we did is we first trained a, a language model, um, and then we made that language model controllable on a set of in, uh, on a set of intents, uh, what, we, what we call intents, which are basically like an action that we want to play and an action that we would like the other player to play. And so this gives us a way to generate dialogue that's not just trying to imitate the human style, um, whatever a human would say in this situation, but to actually give it a, a, a an intent, a purpose in its communication. We can talk about a specific move or we can make a specific request. And the determination of what that move is that we're discussing comes from um, strategic re a strategic reasoning model that uses reinforcement learning and planning. So the computing the intents for all the players, how is that done? Just so, as a starting point, is that with reinforcement learning or is that just optimal, determining what the optimal is for intents? It's a combination of reinforcement learning and planning. Um, actually, very similar to how you approach how we approached poker and how people approached like chess and go as well. We're using self play and and search to try to figure out what are what is an optimal move for us and what is a desirable move that we would like this other player to play. Now, the the difference between the way that we approached reinforcement learning and search in this game versus those previous games 
is that we have to keep it human compatible. We have to understand how the other person is likely to play rather than just assuming that they're going to play like a machine. And how language gets them to play um, in a way that maximizes the chance of following the intent you want mm -hmm. them to follow. Okay, how do, how do you do that? How do you, could you, how do you connect language to intent? So the way that RL and, and planning is done is actually not using language. So we're, we're coming up with this like plan for the action uh, that we're going to play and the other person's going to play. And then we feed that action into the dialogue model that will then send a message according to those plans. So the language model there is mapping action to... To message. To message. Yeah. One word at a time. Uh, basically like one message at a time. So we'll, we'll feed into the dialogue model. Like here are the actions that you should be discussing. Here's the message. Here's like the, the content of the message that we would like you to send. And then it will actually generate a message that corresponds to that. Okay. Does this actually work? It works surprisingly well. Okay. How, <laughs> oh man, the, the number of ways it probably goes horribly. <laughs> I would have imagined it goes horribly wrong. Um, so how the heck is it effective at all? I mean, there are a lot of ways that this could fail. So for example, I mean, you could have a situation where you're you're basically like, we don't tell the, the language model, like here are the pieces of our action or the other person's action that you should be communicating. Mm -hmm. And so like, let's say you're about to t attack somebody. You probably don't want to tell them that you're going to attack them, mm -hmm. but there's nothing in the language, like the language model is not very smart at the end of the day. So it, it doesn't really have a way of knowing like, well, what should I be talking about? Should I tell this person that I'm about to attack them or not? Um, so we have to like develop a lot of other techniques that that deal with that. Um, like one of the things we do, for example, is we try to calculate if I'm going to send this message, what would I expect the other person to do in response? So if it's a message like, hey, I'm going to attack you this turn, they're probably going to, you know, attack us or, or defend against that attack. Um, and so we have a way of recognizing like, hey, sending this message is a negative expected value action, and we should not send this message. So yes, for, for particular kinds of messages, you have like an extra function that does the, uh, the estimates the value of that message. Yeah, so we have these kinds of filters right. that like- So it's a filter. So there's a there's a good, uh, and is that filter in your network or is it rule-based? That's that's a that's a neural network. So we're, well, it's a, it's a combination. It's a neural network, but it's also using planning. Um, it's trying to compute like what is the policy that the other players are going to play given that this message um, has been sent and then is that better than not sending the message or, or I feel like that's how my brain works too like there's a language model that generates random crap and then there's these other neural nets that are essentially filters at least that's when I tweet I'll, I'll usually my process of tweeting I'll think of something and it's hilarious to me. And then about five seconds later, the, the filter network comes in and says, no, uh -huh. no, that's not funny at all. I mean, there's some something interesting to that kind of process. So you have a set of actions that you, you want, you have an intent that you want to achieve, an intent that you want your opponent to achieve, then you generate messages, and then you evaluate if those messages will achieve the, t the, the, uh, the goal you want. Yeah, and we're filtering for several things. We're filtering like, is this a, a sensible message? You know, so sometimes language models will send, will generate messages that are just like totally nonsense, um, and we try to filter those out. We also try to filter out messages that that are basically lies. Um, so, you know, diplomacy has this reputation as a game that's really about um, deception and lying, mm -hmm. but we try to actually minimize the amount that the bot would lie. Um, this was. Actually, mostly a... Or are you? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, part yeah. of the reason for this is that we actually found that lying would make the bot perform worse in the long run. It would end up with a lower score. Because once the bot lies, um, people would never trust it again. And and trust is a huge aspect of the game of diplomacy. I'm taking notes here, because I think this is, applies to... To, to life lessons too. Oh, I uh, think it's a really, yeah, really strong. So lesson. like lying is a dangerous thing to do. Like you, you want to avoid uh, obvious lying. Yeah, I mean, I think when people play diplomacy for the first time, they approach it as a game of deception and lying. And, and they, ultimately, if you talk to top diplomacy players, what they'll tell you is that diplomacy is a game about trust and being able to build trust in an environment that encourages people to not trust anyone. 
So, so that's the ultimate tension in diplomacy. How can this AI reason about whether you are being honest in your communication? And how can the AI persuade you that it is being honest when it is telling you that, hey, I'm actually going to support you this turn? Is there some sense, I don't know if you step back and think that this process will indirectly help us study human psychology? So like if trust is the ultimate goal, wouldn't that help us understand what are the fundamental aspects of forming trust between humans and between humans and AI? I mean, that's a really, really important question that's much bigger than, than strategy games. Is how can that, that's fundamental to the human robot interaction problem. How do we form trust between intelligent entities? So one of the things I'm really excited about with diplomacy, um, there's never really been a good domain to investigate these kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, and diplomacy gives us a domain where trust is really at the center of it. Um, and it's not just like you've hired a bunch of mechanical Turkers that you know, are being paid and trying to get through the task as quickly as possible. You have these people that are really invested in the outcome of the game and they're really trying to do the, the best that they can. Um, and so I'm really excited that we're able to, we, we actually like have put together this we're open sourcing all of our models. We're open sourcing uh, all of the all of the code, and we're making the data that we've used available to researchers, um, so that they can investigate these kinds of questions. So the data of the different the human and the AI, AI play of diplomacy, and the models that you use for the generation of the messages and the filtering. Yeah, not not just even the data of the AI playing with the humans, but all the training data that we that we had that we use to train the AI to understand how humans play the game. We're setting up a system where researchers will be able to apply um, to be able to gain access to that data and be able to, to use it in their own research. We should say, what is the name of the system? We're calling the bot Cicero. Cicero. And what's the name, like the, you're open sourcing, what's the name of the repository and, and the, like the, the project? Is it also just called Cicero, the big project? Um, or are you still coming up with a name? The, the data set comes from this website, webdiplomacy.net is this site that's been online for like 20 years now. And uh, it's one of the main sites that people use to play diplomacy on it. We've got like 50,000 games of diplomacy with you know natural language communication, um, over 10 million messages. So it's a pretty massive data set that people can use to, um, we're hoping that the, the academic community, the research community is able to use it for, for all sorts of interesting research questions. So do you, from having studied this game, is it, a sufficiently rich problem space to explore this kind of human AI interaction. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's I think it's maybe the best data set that I can think of out there to to investigate these kinds of questions of um, negotiation, trust, um, persuasion. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best data set in the world for um, human AI interaction. That's a very broad field, but I think that it's definitely up there is like, you know, if if you're really interested in language models interacting with humans in you know, a setting where their incentives are not fully aligned, this seems like an ideal data set for investigating that. So you have, um, you have a, a paper with some impressive results and just an impressive paper that taking this problem on. What's the most exciting thing to you in terms of the results from the, the paper? Well, I think there's- Ideas a few... or results? Yeah, I think there's a few aspects of the results and um, that, that I think are really exciting. So first of all, the fact that we were able to achieve such strong performance, um, I was surprised by and pleasantly surprised by. Um, so we played 40 games of diplomacy with real humans and the bot placed second out of all players that have played five or more games. So it's about 80 players total, um, 19 of whom played five or more games and the bot was ranked second out of those players. Um, and the bot was was really good in two dimensions. One, being able to establish strong connections with the other players on the board, being able to like persuade them to work with it, um, being able to coordinate with them about like how it's going to work with them. And then also the raw tactical and strategic aspects of the game, you know, being able to understand what the other players are likely to do, being able to model their behavior and respond appropriately to that, the bot also really excelled at. What are some interesting things that the bot said? By the way, are you allowed to swear in the um, 
Like, are there rules to what you're allowed to say and not in diplomacy? You can say whatever you want. I think the site will get very angry at you if you start like threatening somebody. And <laughs> we actually- <laughs> or, like if you threaten somebody, you're, su you're supposed to do it politely. Yeah, politely. You know, like keep it in character. Um, the- <laughs> The bot. We actually had a researcher watching the bot twenty four seven for well. Whenever we play a game, we had a bot watching it to make sure that it wouldn't go off the rails and start like threatening somebody or something like that. I would just love it if the bot started like mocking, mocking everybody. Like some weird quirky strategies would emerge. Have you seen anything interesting that you? Huh. That's a weird. That's a. That's a weird behavior either of the filter or the, or the language model, that was weird to you. That was yeah. There were definitely like things that the bot would would do that were not in line with like how humans would approach the game and that in, in a good way the humans actually you know we we've talked with some expert diplomacy players about these results mm -hmm. and their takeaway is that well maybe humans are approaching this the wrong way and this is actually like the right way to play the game um so, so wh what's required to win like what um what does it mean to mess up or to exploit the suboptimal behavior of a player like um uh, is there uh, is there optimally rational behavior and irrational behavior that you need to estimate that kind of stuff? Like what what stands out to you? Like is there a crack that you can exploit? Is there like um, a weakness that you can exploit in the game that that, that everybody's looking for? Well, I, I think you're asking kind of two questions there. So one, like modeling the irrationality and the suboptimality of of humans. Um, you can't in diplomacy. You can't treat all the other players like they're machines. And if you do that, you're you're going to end up playing really poorly. And so we actually ran this experiment. So we we trained a bot in a two player zero sum version of diplomacy, um, the same way that you might approach a game like chess or poker. And the bot was superhuman. It would crush any competitor. And then we took that same training approach and we trained a bot for the full seven player version of the game through self play, without any human data. And we stuck it in a game with six humans and it got destroyed. Even in the version of the game where there's no explicit natural language communication, it still got destroyed because it just wouldn't be able to understand how the other players were approaching the game and be able to, to work with that. Can, um, you, can, you, can you just linger on that meaning? Like there's an individual there's an individual personality to each player and then you're supposed to remember that? But what do you mean it's not able to understand the, the players? Well, it would, for example, expect the human to support it in a certain way when the human would simply like think like, no, I'm not supposed to support you here. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you develop a self-driving car and it's trained completely from scratch with other self-driving cars, it might learn to drive on the left side of the road. Hmm. And that's a totally reasonable thing to do if you're with these other self-driving cars that are also driving on the left side of the road. But if you put it in an American city, it's gonna crash. But I guess the intuition I'm trying to build up is why does it then crush a human player on heads up? This versus is, multiple. This is an aspect of, of two-player zero-sum versus games that involve cooperation. So in a two-player zero-sum game, um, you can do self-play from scratch and you will arrive at the Nash equilibrium where you don't have to worry about the other player playing in a very human suboptimal style. That's just going to be... that. The only way that deviating from a Nash equilibrium um, would, would change things is if it helped you. So I... What's the dynamic of cooperation that's effective in diplomacy? Do you always have to to have one friend in the game? You always want to maximize your friends and minimize your enemies. Got it. And boy, and the the lying comes into play there. So the the more friends you have, the better. Yeah, I mean, I guess you have to attack somebody, or else you're not going to make progress. All right. So that's the tension, but. Man, this is too real. This is too real. To, this is too too close to geo, geopolitics of actual military conflict in the world. Okay, uh, that's fascinating. So that cooperation element is what makes the game really, really hard. Yeah, and to give you an, an like an example of of how this suboptimality and irrationality comes into play, there's a really common situation in a game of diplomacy. Um, that where one player starts to win and they're like at the point where they're controlling about half the map. Yeah. Um, and the remaining players who have all been fighting each other the whole game all have to like work together now to stop this other player from winning or else everybody's going to lose. Um, 
And it's kind of like, you know, Game of Thrones. Like, I don't know if you've seen the show. Where, yeah. Like, you know, you got the the others coming from the north and like all the people have to start, you work out the differences and stop them from from taking over. Um, and the bot will do this. Like the bot will work with the other players to stop the superpower from winning. But if it doesn't really, if it's trained from scratch or it doesn't really have a good grounding in how humans approach it, it will also at the same time attack the other players with its extra units. Mm -hmm. So all the units that are not necessary to stop the superpower from winning, it will use those to grab as many centers as possible from the other players. And in totally rational play, the other players should just live with that. You know, they have to understand like, hey, a score of one is better than a score of zero. So, um, so okay, he's grabbed my centers, but I, I'll just deal with it. But humans don't act that way, right? The human gets really angry at the bot and ends up throwing the game because, you know, I'm going to screw you over because you did something that's not fair to me. Got it. And are you supposed to model that? Is the bot supposed to model that kind of human frustration? Yeah, exactly. And so that is something that seems almost impossible to model purely from scratch without any human data. It's a very cultural thing. Yeah. Um, and so you need human data to be able to understand that, hey, that's how humans behave. And you have to work around that. It might be suboptimal, it might be irrational, but but that's an aspect of, of humanity that you have to ha you have to deal with. So how difficult is it to train on human data given that human data is very limited versus what the, a, a purely self-play mechanism can generate? That's actually one of the major challenges that we faced in the research, that we had a good amount of human data. We had about 50,000 games. What we try to do is leverage as much self-play as possible while still um, leveraging the human data. Um, so what we do is we do self-play, um, very similar to how it's been done in poker and Go, but we try to regularize the self-play towards the human data. Basically, the way to think about it is um, we penalize the bot for choosing actions that are very unlikely under how under the human data set. And how so, do you know? Is there is this some kind of function that says this is human like and not? Yeah. So we we train a bot through supervised learning to model the human play as much as possible. So we basically like train a neural net um, on those fifty thousand games, and that gives us an approximate that gives us a policy that resembles to some extent how humans actually play the game. Now, this isn't a perfect model of human play because we don't have unlimited data. We don't have unlimited neural net capacity, um, but it gives us some approximation. Uh, is there some data on the internet that's useful besides just diplomacy? So on the language side of things, is there some, can you go to like Reddit and <laughs> um, so sort of background model formulation that, that's useful for the game of diplomacy? Yeah, absolutely. And so for the language model, which um, it's kind of like a separate question. You know, we didn't use the language model during self-play training, but we pre-trained the language model on you know tons of internet data um, as much as possible, and then we fine-tuned it specifically on the diplomacy games. So we are able to like leverage the wider data set in order to uh, fill in some of the gaps in like how communication happens more broadly, um, besides just like specifically in these diplomacy games. Okay, cool. So, what what some what are some interesting things that came to life from this from this work uh, to you? Like, what what are some insights about um, about games with uh, where natural language is involved and cooperation, deep cooperation is involved? Well, I think there's a few insights. Um, so, first of all, the fact that you can't rely purely or even largely on self play that you really have to have an understanding of how humans approach the game. Um, I think that that's one of the major conclusions that I'm drawing from this work. Um, and that is, I think, applicable more broadly to a lot of different games. So we've actually already taken the approaches that we've used in diplomacy and tried them on a cooperative card game called Hanabi. And we've had a lot of success in that game as well. Um, on the language side, I think the fact that we were able to control the language model um, through this intense approach was very effective. Um, and it allowed us, instead of just imitating how humans would communicate, we're able to go beyond that and able to um, feed into it superhuman strategies that it can then um, you know, generate messages corresponding to. Is there something you could say about detecting whether a person or AI is lying or not? The bot doesn't explicitly try to calculate whether somebody is lying or not. But what it will do is 
try to predict what actions they're going to take given the communications, given the messages that they've sent to us. So given our conversation, what do I think you're going to do? And implicitly, there is a calculation about whether you're lying to me in that. You know, if if you're, based on your messages, if I think you're going to attack me this turn, um, even though your messages say that you're not, then, you know, essentially the bot is predicting that you're lying. But it doesn't view it as as lying the same way that we would view it as lying. But you could probably reformulate with all the same data and make a classifier lying or not. Yeah, I think I think you could do that. Um, that was not something that we were focused on, but I think that it is possible that, you know, if you came up with some measurements of like, what does it mean to tell a lie? Because there's there's a spectrum, right? Like if you're withholding some information, is that a lie? Um, if you're mostly telling the truth, but you forgot to mention this like one action out of like 10, is that a lie? Um, it's hard to draw the line, but mm-hmm. you know, if you're willing to do that and then you could possibly use it to, uh, to. This feels like an argument inside a relationship now. <laughs> <laughs> what constitutes a lie? Um, Depends what you mean by the definition of the word is. Okay. Um, Still, it's fascinating because trust and lying is all intermixed into this and it's language models that are becoming more and more sophisticated. It's just a fascinating space to explore. Mm -hmm. Um, What what, what, what do you see as the future of this work um, that is inspired by the breakthrough performance that you're getting here with diplomacy? Um, uh, I think there's a few different directions to take this work. Um, I, I think really what it's showing us is the potential that language models have. I mean, I think a lot of people didn't think that this kind of result was possible even today, despite all the progress that's been made in language models. And, and so it shows us how we can leverage the power of things like self-play on top of language models to get, um, increasingly better performance. And, um, the ceiling is really much higher than what we have right now. Is this transferable somehow to to chatbots for the more general task of dialogue? So because there is a kind of negotiation here, a dance between entities that are trying to cooperate and at the same time a little bit adversarial, which I think maps somewhat to the general, you know, the entire process of Reddit <laughs> or like internet communication. You're cooperating, you're adversarial, you're having debates, you're having uh, camaraderie, all that kind of stuff. I think one of the things that's really useful about diplomacy is that we have a well-defined value function. There is a, a well-defined score that the bot is right. trying to optimize. And and in a in a setting like a general chatbot setting, it needs it would need that kind of um, objective in order to fully leverage the techniques that we've developed. What about like what we talked about earlier with NPCs inside video games? Like how can it be used to create uh, for Elder Scrolls Six more compelling um, NPCs that you could talk to instead of instead of committing all kinds of violence with a sword and fighting dragons, just sitting in a tavern and drink all day and talk to the chatbot. The way that we've approached AI and diplomacy is you condition the language on an intent. Now, that intent in diplomacy is an an action, but it doesn't have to be. And you can imagine, you know, you could have NPCs in video games or the metaverse or whatever, where there's some intent or there's some objective that they're trying to maximize, and you can specify what that is. Um, and, And then the language can correspond to that intent. Now, I'm not saying that this is, you know, happening imminently, but um, I'm saying that this is like a future application potentially of this direction of research. So what's the more general formulation of this? Making self-play be able to scale the way self-play does and still maintain human-like behavior. The way that we've approached self-play in diplomacy is like, we're, we're trying to come up with good intents to condition the language model on. And the space of intents is actions that can be played in the game. Now, there is like the potential to have a broader set of intents. Things like, you know, long-term cooperation or long-term uh, objectives or, you know, gossip about what another player was saying. Um, these are things that we're currently not conditioning the language model on. And so it's not able to, we're not able to control it to say like, oh, you should be talking about this thing right now. But it's quite possible that you could expand the scope of intents 
to be able to allow it to talk about those things. Now, in the process of doing that, the self-play would become much more complicated. Um, and so that is a potential for, for future work. Okay, the increasing the number of intents. I still am not quite clear how you keep the self-play integrated into the human world. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit loose on, the, uh, on understanding how you do that. So we train a neural net to um, imitate the human data as closely as possible. And that's what we call the anchor policy. And now when we're doing self-play, the, the problem with the anchor policy is that it's not a perfect approximation of how humans actually play. Because we don't have infinite data, because we don't have um, unlimited neural network capacity, it's actually a relatively suboptimal approximation of how humans actually play. And we can improve that approximation by adding planning and RL. And so what we do is we get a better approximation, a better model of human play by during the self-play process, we say you can deviate from this human anchor policy if there is an action that has, you know, particularly high expected value. Um, but it would have to be a really high expected value in order to to deviate from from this human-like policy. So you basically say try to maximize your expected value while at the same time stay as close as possible to the human policy. And there is a parameter that controls those. The, the relative weighting of those competing objectives. So the question I have is how sophisticated can the anchor policy get? So I have a policy that approximates human behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you increase the number of intents, as you generalize the, the space in which this is uh, applicable, and given that the human data is limited, try to anticipate a policy that works for in a much larger number of cases. Like how, how difficult is the process of forming a damn good anchor policy? Well, it really comes down to how much human data you have. So it's all boss scale in the human data. I think the more human data you have, the better. And I think that that's going to be the major bottleneck in, yeah. in scaling to, to more complicated um, domains. But that said, you know, there might be the potential, just like in the language model where we leveraged you know, tons of data on the internet and then specialized it for diplomacy, um, there is the future potential that you can leverage huge amounts of data across the board and then specialize it in the data set that you have for diplomacy. And in that way, you're essentially augmenting the amount of data that you have.